Let us pray. What in the world, God, what in the world are you seeking to tell us in this scripture? We need your Holy Spirit to find good news in your word today. We need your spirit of love to break through to us. So give us ears to hear good news. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When we were in Minnesota, it's uh, both of my children's birthdays. And so my husband and I were going around the cute little gift shops in Nisswa, Minnesota, trying to find things for the girls. And we walked into one of the little touristy places, and there was a sticker with a rainbow and the words, Jesus loves the people you hate. Oh my goodness, there it was, the sticker for one of my daughters. For she is a lover of justice and making her voice heard, and she wants people to know that Jesus believes black lives matter and that no person is illegal and that we must trust women. This is a great little sticker, I thought. Yeah. And just as I was relishing, thinking about all the people Jesus loves and feeling quite a bit self-righteous because I love all the people Jesus loves, Jesus tapped me on the shoulder and says, uh, no, you don't. And I said to Jesus, well, yes, I do. And Jesus said, mm, no, you don't. Of course I do. And then Jesus says, Molly, really? And I started to say, well, I hate the people who hate. Mm-hmm. And then I thought it was really good that Jesus loves the people I don't. So to put it mildly, this parable of the wheat and weeds is problematic. Beyond slave labor, it seems to divide the world into wheat and weeds, good and evil, saved and damned, such stark dualism that leaves no room for shades of gray, and it's violent. Evildoers are collected by angels and thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth while the righteous shine like the sun. Dang. I spent a lot of time this week thinking, hmm, well, maybe I'll only preach on the first part of this passage. That would be so nice. I could pretend that this weeping and gnashing of teeth just wasn't in the Bible. But of course, it is. And we have to deal with it. Because these are just the kinds of scripture that people who name others as weeds will take into themselves and into their own hands and do violence or harm the designated weeds. So what are we to do with this scripture? The first thing I want to say about it is that we are responsible for how we read scripture. And we are responsible for what interpretations of scripture we ex accept. And we have to remember that the Bible is a human document. People wrote it. And this being a human document reflects our reality. 
And sometimes it reflects our fears and our angers. And we say that scripture is only the word of God by the Holy Spirit. If we're not looking for the Holy Spirit, it's not the word of God. And sometimes after scripture like this, I wish we wouldn't say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, because I'm not grateful for all of this scripture. If it's not life-giving, we have to reject it. The church has set some rules about how to read and interpret scripture. And one such rule is the rule of love. All scripture is to be read in light of Christ's command to love God and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And any interpretation of a text that promotes hatred of any person or group cannot be accepted. The scripture is in two parts. First, a parable, which is meant to be a metaphor and is meant to make us think. It is meant to turn our world upside down. It is meant to trouble us. It is meant to help us see something new and different. It's meant to be life-giving. The second part of our scripture, Matthew takes the parable and makes it an allegory. The difference between a parable and an allegory is one is a story and the other one is a fixed interpretation. So Matthew takes away some of the mystery and problems and just solves them for his community. And he says, well, the enemy is Satan and the weeds are children of Satan and God's going to send the reapers to come and collect those children and throw them in the fire. I think this reflects Matthew's anxieties and anger far more than God's grace. If a text is not promoting love, either we aren't reading it right or we have to reject it. Jesus is trying to tell us something about the kingdom of God. That there is something here about God saving work in the world. So that now that I have given you kind of the academic background of the difference between parables and allegory, Let's get on with it. As I wrestled with this text, and that's what Presbyterians do. We wrestle with text. It is just not easy to be Presbyterian because we have to think really hard. But as I wrestled with this text, I remembered my mother who loved to garden. And she took particular satisfaction in weeding. She would not like this parable at all. She loved cleaning up her garden. She would come into the house with her back bent over, her knees smudged with dirt, and happy. It was just so satisfying to pull those weeds. On occasion, she would ask one of us children to help her, and of course, that was a mistake. Sometimes it was obvious to me what was a weed, but a lot of times it wasn't. And more often than not, or at least sometimes, I would have a grip on a bunch of stems, and I would be tightening my fingers and getting ready to yank when my mom would yell, stop! No! That's not a weed. That's, and she would name some plant. And I would think, okay, 
She had saved that plant in the nick of time. And isn't that what the landowner does in Jesus' parable? Stop the workers from pulling up the good wheat? Now, I want to go deeply into this because the parable never really says that the problem is that you can't tell the wheat from the weeds. Although there's some of that certainly there. What the master says is you can't pull up the weeds because you will hurt the wheat. You will hurt the whole. Roots are so intricately intertwined. People, our lives, are so intricately intertwined. Good and evil are so intricately intertwined in our lives and in our world that we can't just say this is evil and this is good and yank it out. Each one of our hearts and souls is a mixture of wheat and weeds. This is about community and being one and not destroying ourselves or each other in any self-righteousness. It is just so real. Harmed unto one person harms all. Love shown to another person loves all. I'm quoting a Professor Carroll at Presbyterian Seminary when I say, Good and evil are all mixed up. Helpful and harmful are mixed up all around us and within us as individuals and communities. So I think this parable is both a warning about self-righteousness and it is about people in community loving one another. And in that love, seeking to overcome evil, not on our own, but certainly by God's grace. A young woman grew up in the church. She attended Sunday school from the time she was a little child. As she grew up, she went to youth group, went on all the retreats, all of the parties that the youth had. She was confirmed in the faith. When her mother died, the church came around her, but when a few years later, her father passed away, and with no siblings, she became lost. Or so we believed. She drifted away from the community. We didn't know how to reach her. Eventually, she suffered from addiction. She made very bad choices and had bad relationships and was taken advantage of. It's hard to imagine how difficult those years were for her. On one occasion, the local paper printed a story about a terrible situation she got into. There was no mercy. She was a weed. In what has been one of the most meaningful moments of my life, was when, more than 20 years later, she sent me an email. She's the mother of two beautiful children. She's happy 
and she's healthy. And she credits church, Sunday school, and the people in the community who loved her. She credits youth group and worship services and words of hope and love that stayed with her. All those years we thought she was lost, she said she never stopped believing and praying and keeping her faith. All those years we thought she was lost, Jesus had hold of her. Love that had been planted in her life had put down roots deep enough. That she was sustained and her life was bearing good, good fruit. It is our job as followers of Christ and in a church community is our job to love everyone God sends our way. And this does not mean accepting bad behavior or poor choices or anything that harms the community or anyone in it because that would not be love. Love requires that we stand up to evil with humility. And any justice we seek must also be mixed with mercy. The intensity of this parable comes in the interpretation which Matthew wrote, not Jesus. Scholars are pretty clear on that. The fire and the brimstone, the community must have been suffering for Matthew to go and say these words. And I can imagine that they needed to hear in no uncertain terms that the evil they faced would end. Matthew is trying his hardest to give suffering people hope. The Roman soldiers who are beating down your doors or the Russian armies that are invading your cities in Ukraine, this will not go on forever. That's what Matthew is getting at. They need to hear, just like we need to hear, the kingdom of God will come on earth as it is in heaven. Do not give up. Do not lose hope. Love. 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 The hate we harbor, the prejudice we hold, the anger that burns inside of each one of us, The violence we as a society commit, the wars we wage, the systems of injustice that we continue to support, the destruction we have done to the earth will not have the last word. And this happens not because we weed people out. It happens when we strengthen community and know that we are all part of each other. And we are one. And no one is saved or whole until all are. I take great hope that angels are weeding my heart and soul to root out my prejudice and my inability to love as Jesus commands. Jesus loves the people we don't. We 
This is our hope for the future and for the present. Jesus loves. Even those we cannot abide are God's favorites too. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen.